Hi, and welcome to Power of 10, a podcast about design operating at many levels, zooming out from thoughtful detail through to organizational transformation and onto changes in society and the world. My name's Andy Pallain. I'm a service design and innovation consultant, coach, trainer, and writer. Power of 10 is also about interesting people and their journeys into design. Today's interesting person is Katja Forbes, Managing Director of Design at Australia and New Zealand. Katja is also on the global board of the Interaction Design Association. Back in 2014, Katja founded SIFT, or SIFTI, a specialist business in research and experience design. And then in late 2018, her business was acquired by international firm Wipro, and she was announced as Managing Director of Australia and New Zealand for Design It. Katya, welcome to Power of 10. Oh, thank you so much. I love getting introduced. It always just makes me feel so special and accomplished. <laughs> so uh, did I get SIFTE, right? SIFTE, yeah, it's actually, that's pretty good. So SIFTE is a Swedish word. Uh, it means purpose. I was looking for a good name for my company and trying to to find something that resonated with me personally, I guess, in looking at my, my heritage, which is Scandinavian. Right. Uh, the word I really wanted, uh, which is a Finnish word, uh, sissu, which sort of means strength and gumption, but of a very female variety, sissu is, uh, it, it, yeah, that's a, a great Finnish word. However, uh, it is a great Finnish word, and so a lot of organisations had already kind of claimed it. So I went hunting for something else and came up with sifta, which is purpose, and it was a purposeful business, and so it seemed the right one to go with. Right. We were just talking before that uh, that cis you probably wouldn't have gone down so well in Australia. It would have been size you. Oh, God. Look, Australians, this is a gross generalisation, <laughs> but Australians <laughs> have a lot of trouble pronouncing anything complicated. I speak of lived experience here. My name is Katya, okay? Now, there were no other Katyas in my school when I was growing up. There was no other Katyas that I knew. And so my name just got completely brutalized by all of my school friends. And so, you know, I feel like I kind of even brought it on myself again, choosing a, a little bit of a difficult company name. <laughs> Sifter is not like straightforward. So, yes, it's it's a, a, a more... Um, yeah, difficult choice, I guess, to go with with something that is non-English first. However, it spoke to what I was trying to do, so I'm good with that. That's good. And well, now uh, is the name retired now? The name is retired. It is retired, and because Sifter became Design It, Design It Australia and New Zealand, and so as part of that, we it, it was a, it was an acquisition of of humans and contracts and and assets and things like that but it was not an acquisition of the brand because the the designer brand is actually super strong already particularly yeah, in the scandinavian and countries global, yeah so yeah. i mean there's there was no need for them to acquire an australian brand they just they needed the the place to to stand up design at australia and new zealand and we were that place Great. So I was trying to think when we met, and I think we might have met just as you had founded Sifter, I think in around 2014, maybe a UX Australia or something. Mm. That's where I think or you might have met. I remember, no, I met you in a workshop that you were giving at UX Australia. Yeah. Yes. That was at UX Australia. Yes. So I reckon that might have been around around then. I'd mm. have to go and have back, look back at the dates. So I don't know, maybe you hadn't quite started it then. Tell me a little bit about your journey because, uh, you know, the, the last – what, sort of six years of it have been pretty a steep, meteoric rise into leadership. But tell me about how you sort of got to the point where you thought, I'm going to start my own company. I spent some time, like I spent 10 years in London, first of all, working for all sorts of different organisations, starting with Sapient, which taught me how to be a consultant and experience yeah. that I, would, I wouldn't trade for anything. I learned so much in that organisation the five years that I worked with them. And then I, I worked a little bit client side in, in places like Yahoo, Thomson Reuters, and then coming back to Australia, found myself literally going back in time because London was so far ahead in terms of design practice at that time. We're talking 2010. And so I came back to Australia and, and found that I was having to have conversations that, such as I would have never have had when I was in the UK, particularly around inclusion and accessibility and just basic fundamental digital access for people with a disability. This was all right. new. It was super new in Australia at the time. And I came back here and, and didn't quite know where to land. I didn't know anybody anymore. Ten years away from the country where you grew up is a, a long time. Had a lot of trouble. Yeah 
fitting in. All of my friends from school had they'd gone on and had kids and were doing things that I couldn't relate to anymore. And so I found the easiest way to try and find my feet was to jump into some freelancing. And so that's what I did. And I freelanced for a few agencies here. And then like, you know, all good freelancers ended up at a bank. Um, Australia is very strong in its design practice in our financial services sector. And I was lucky enough to to start out at, at one of the strongest now, uh, the Commonwealth Bank, and worked there for a number of years as a freelancer and kind of got to the the end of of wanting to work on just one project or just one product or just one industry sector and so left that consultancy gig and started up my first business with a business partner and we tried to make a go of inclusive design as a practice but I think we just we went a yeah. little bit too early and so it wasn't the the raging success that we'd hoped it would be and now I, I watch in awe as organizations like Intopia here in Australia are ragingly successful in having yeah, inclusion and accessibility well. as yeah. their practice and making a business out of it. So I learned some really good lessons in starting that business and then after that business wasn't as successful as I hoped, I went back to Commonwealth Bank and just thought, I'll just sit here and breathe for a bit and figure out what I'm going to do. And landing in my lap at that time was one of the largest and most challenging contextual inquiry projects that I had ever been offered. And it was to go and have a look about how all staff in Commonwealth Bank used their CRM technology. And I was like, all the staff? They're like, yeah, all the staff. We want you to go and look at all 18 departments. And I was like, oh, (laughs) can I get some people to help me with that? Because that's a pretty big job. And also maybe can I go and get my own people? Because I've got some really good people I think who'd be great to work on this. Mm. Bank's like, yeah, sure, that's fine. But you have to be a PTY LTD, so an incorporated company. Otherwise, we'll get superannuation liability. And I was like, oh, okay. So I started my company. Not every origin story is sexy and amazing. Mine started with trying to avoid superannuation liability. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but, you know, the, someone else's avoidance is your gain then. And, that's uh, and it was an amazing project. We did 107 observations of people doing work all over Australia. It was fascinating. Mm. And then they said, oh, could you have a look at this for us as well? And I was like, oh, I'll have to get another person. Could you have a look at this too? Yeah, absolutely. But I'll need to get another person. And then I had seven people working for me. I was like, ooh, I probably should get another client if I want to keep this company sustainable. (laughs) So all of it was kind of happy accident, hard graft as well, and opportunity being in the right place at the right time with the right people. I actually employed a number of people straight out of General Assembly who were transitioning from their uh, current projects or current current jobs in you know working for Accenture as business intelligence analysts and reskilling themselves in user experience design and gave them their first shot out of that and I'm so proud of that crew of people and where they are now ones at Google you know that they, they've they've dispersed themselves all around you know different parts of the design practice in Australia and I'm super proud that I was able to give them their start my favorite thing is offering people a job as a business yeah. owner, that's that's one of the most gratifying things you, I think you can do, which is create jobs for people, create work for people, facilitate spaces for great work to get done. I mean, I've been off the tools for some time now. I wouldn't yeah. ask me to design anything because I, I literally have been away from the hands-on practice for such a long time that I think there's better people to do it. But I know that I'm very capable of creating a great space for work to get done that's of terrific quality and for people to learn and for people to really, you know, stretch into to different parts of our craft and our practice. So let's, I mean, let's talk about that because there's two strands there which I'm imagining have sort of woven together as part of your DNA as a leader. And one is, you know, you, you mentioned before that, that your time at Sapien taught you to be a consultant because there's there's definitely i mean you were kind of very self-aware of you know we were a bit too early for the accessibility and inclusive design and so forth there's a you know being able to speak the right language and tell the story and the narrative of what you're trying to uh, sell ultimately but actually the kind of change you're trying to create 
to people who may be needing that change, who may be um, probably not ready for that change, is a large part of it. And then the other side is the people skills. I know you've spent a lot of time, when you said you're off the tools, I was thinking, well, maybe you've just kind of zoomed up a level in the sense mm. that your interest in people and how people tick and how they use and how they use their tools and form part of the role of being a leader and setting up an organization and, and maintaining that culture. How much of that sort of resonates with you? Is that is that a kind of fair summary of, of it? And which which bits do you kind of really lean on a lot? I think the zoom out aspect of it absolutely resonates. I would say that uh, I've, I've done a, a bit of leadership training. And something from that leadership training, which I have absolutely used in my practice of, of the, those abilities, is the concept of being, you know, up on the balcony or down on the dance floor and leading from the balcony strategically, you know, working on the business rather than being down on the dance floor and being in the business. Mm. There's points in time where, you know, as a leader, you do have to get down on the dance floor and boogie because... People, you know, stuff goes wrong. People need you. People need you to escalate to and and also sometimes, you know, hold their hands as they get through difficult stuff. But the concept of being zoomed out, I absolutely do resonate with that. But I I, I call it being being up on the balcony and, you know, taking that bird's yeah. eye strategic view of what's going on and what people are up to and, and how things are going. So I'm interested in what that transition was like for you. I wrote this piece a little while ago and it's something that sort of a lot of people come to me for for coaching about the sort of design leadership dip, which is this moment where you're kind of starting to let go of your tools and your kind of skill in those, which is often part of your identity very much as a, as a person and certainly professionally. And then you're sort of moving into this leadership role and you're not quite so good at that either. So there's this kind of dip in the middle where you're sort of a bit rubbish at both for a while. And for some people, it's a real existential crisis. For other people, sort of sink a little bit and then swim and, and fly. How was it for you, that journey? I feel like I'm of the school of so long as I'm one page ahead of everybody else and they don't know that it's only one page that I'm ahead, I'm good. I've got it. I can tell you've been a teacher. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> yes, that is very true. I have I have taught design um, both at uh, General Assembly and at University of Sydney. But I'm, I'm also a very I, – I don't need a lot of preparation, I don't think. And I think it it just comes from comes from so many so many public speaking engagements, so many talks, so many presentations, so many leading of workshops, so many being up and facilitating. And and I've I've had this conversation with uh, Steve Beatty actually about uh, you know well conversation slash disagreement um, about you know what what are we as design practitioners now? Because I find in my practice and directly you know contributing to my transition to leadership that facilitation. And the ability yeah. to get people to listen and talk and get to consensus and align and, and you know, get shared understanding through creating artifacts or whiteboard, whatever that is, whatever that facilitation looks like. I really feel like that is a very important part of the role that we do as design leaders and also design practitioners, yeah. you know. I know that, that Steve's point of view on that is more like, well, why did we go to design school if all we do is facilitation? And... I think that there's there's different parts of the craft that kind of come together there. There's there's the hands-on part of the craft. There's the creating the design magic part of the craft. There's the understanding humans part of the craft. There's the creating tangible artifacts so that we can all move forward and create something and put the rubber on the road. But I think that facilitation is absolutely a part of the craft and, and, and a very important part of it as well. Wow. What we do... Yeah. It, it might not seem, you know, esoteric to us, but it's esoteric to a lot of people. They don't understand how we work through the design practice to get to solving problems and coming up with different ways of doing things and new approaches and things like that. And, and it's a bit of a mystery magic black box for a lot of people who don't spend their day-to-day -day in the kinds of, of problems and spaces that we do as design practitioners. So our job yeah. and where facilitation really comes in there is demystifying all the stuff that's in that magic black box and helping people use the tools of design to solve their problem, not kind of keeping it as this is my special magic bag of tricks and you don't get to play with it unless you hire me and pay me a whole lot of money. <laughs> 
And then when I'm finished, I'll pack all my tricks back up in my bag and I'll take it away and all the value will walk out the door with me. So I think that in that transition, taking the, say, more practitioner level running of workshops, presenting my designs, defending my designs. Uh, I've had meetings in, in the banks where I've sat with a committee of 20 people going through my wireframes one by one, button by button, you know, interaction by interaction going, why did you do it like that? And being able to facilitate that group of people through to consensus that I do know what I'm doing and I have done it the right way. And and taking that sort of lower, more junior practice through facilitation, through to, you know, public speaking and, and presentation, that's been instrumental in my ability to be a good leader. Because if you can't yeah. tell your own story and tell the stories about the things that matter and that are important, well, nobody's going to buy anything you're selling doesn't matter how good it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I noticed LinkedIn is uh, uh, asking me what your top skill is, and one of the options is wireframing here, so I shall oh, uh, click on that. <laughs> I'm terrible um, at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, LinkedIn's so random. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the, you know, I, I, there's another thing I wrote, which is that I, and I kind of realised that with my coaches looking about saying about how do I manage stakeholders, how do I do this, is, and also how to manage a studio and a group of designers, it's slow motion facilitation. Right? The, the, the same thing you'd do in a kind of week uh, in a day or two days is kind of stretches over weeks and, and months and years in terms of you know, we talked about inclusive design right at the beginning of you know who's who's being included and excluded mm. which is something you're kind of very acutely aware of in a room at least it's harder on zoom but in a room of um you know of people you you literally you see some people sitting off to the side you see someone here where there's a, gr- a table where there's a group of people and there's one person who for, for whatever reason isn't involved right? it's very visible and i think part of the the role of, of leadership in design is kind of trying to have that same view of, well, maybe it's the looking from the balcony. I right? have that mm. same view of, you know, who's dancing together, who's standing at the wall, who's, who's kind of sitting on their own in the corner, right? Yeah, how can we get the sense of belonging for everybody when everybody is so completely diverse mm. and, and from yeah. different, different backgrounds and therefore different lived experiences? And that is definitely yeah. the case. So I, I love metaphors and sometimes they, they keep giving and giving and sometimes they break so let's try this one though which is you know with the the dance floor metaphor you know it's very hard to get everyone dancing all the time i mean there's there's a kind of you know there's a there are certain tracks when the alcohol level is kind of high enough which gets sort of every well maybe everyone dancing but in general you know people who've got different styles of music that they like and they'll ask the dj for different things and half the dance floor leaves and the other half comes on in your design practice, you know, in the in the studio when you're managing that, how how do you kind of make sure there's there's music for everyone? That involves a lot of listening, active listening um, to the people who make up our our design studio family, and it, uh, this is glib, I know, but uh, designers have a lot of feelings. As a group of people, we have a lot of feelings and. Not in any way, shape or form ever dissuaded from feeling all the feelings and sharing all the feelings. Uh, so there's there's kind of a, a, a consistent active listening mode that what well, I find that I need to be mm. in in order to make sure that everyone feels like they are heard and included. I think for us, we're sort of centering around particular particular values that resonate for us at a local level. I mean, design, it has a set of global values and and things like that, and all of those are worthy. But there are some things that resonate more for us at a local level and, you know, some songs that we like to play more than others. For us, we are incredibly passionate about sustainability by design. I know that if I bring a sustainability-based project into our studio, everyone will get up and dance, everyone. Mm. And so being cognizant of what people individually value and what we value collectively really helps to to get that that great I guess participation from everybody in in the studio work and and in wanting to move the studio forward and we do a lot of introspection as well I mean at the moment because you know COVID has has helped us with our you know time to introspect (laughs) due to our pillar client Qantas uh, no longer requiring our services Mm. yeah so I mean we have had some really good 
time to to be introspective about our practice and how we run as a studio and how we operate as a group of people. And the design directors in uh, the design, well, the solitary design director I have, he has been instrumental as well as our leads in creating operating models for our studio around values and making sure that people are always working towards what they might have indicated is interesting for them in their own personal development. So we have very uh, strong talent development practices within Design mm. It that, that are, are set up to ensure that people are paying attention to their development, that our, us as leaders are paying attention to development as well, and that we're trying to foster work in the studio that is going to contribute to it and also contribute to the things that we value. So that would be my answer for that one. We aligning it around values is how we get everybody up and dancing. Yeah. But it's often, I mean, it's often quite hard to, and the values or even coming up with the values is, is you know, oh, often the easy bit, right? They're, they're kind of. Super difficult to get it right though. Super difficult. I mean, yeah, we still haven't got yeah. it right, but we're still trying. But also keeping it alive and keeping it intact in the face of all the other pressures is really hard. So, you know, in what way do you, can you talk about the ways you kind of make that sort of quite tangible and in terms of people's lived everyday experience of, I was going to say going to work, but you remember, remember when we used to go to work um, <laughs> of turning up uh, on Zoom mm. uh, or Teams? Yeah, I think for us, we've used the time that we have had available to us to really immerse into some pro bono work, finding uh, things, or people actually seek us out. They seek me out and uh, I say, can I pick your brains? <laughs> and this is one of my leadership tips. So when people ask to pick your brains, if you want to remain accessible, that's fine. But if you want to protect your most valuable commodity, which is your time, choose one hour a week that is available for brain picking and say, this is the time yeah. that is available for brain picking. You can do it at this time or not at all. And if they're serious about actually engaging and getting advice or information from you, they'll make the time and they'll make it at the time that suits you. So I have people coming to me saying, could I get some some ideas from you about this pro bono project or this thing that I'm doing or, uh, you know, coming in, in that sort of approach? And if I think that it's something that my team is going to be interested in, I'll take it to them and say, we, we've got some capacity, this person is asking for this, is there someone who's interested in taking it forward? And we've got a, a project that we're just kicking off with an organisation called Artists Against Poverty who have been very disrupted by COVID because they generally have done their fundraising, which delivers outcomes for women in, in Indonesia through microfinancing. And they've been very disrupted because their fundraising has been events-based. Come to our exhibition by the art that you see at the right, exhibition. Right. So we're helping them through that disruption. And there's also the ability for my crew to bring to the table pro bono work that they would like to have us consider. And then we'll go through, we'll consider the merits of it, we'll see what we might be able to do to help them, we'll get approval on <laughs> spending things for free and then, you know, either take the project forward or not. And I think allowing for those kinds of social benefit interactions and social benefit projects and also, you know, they don't all have to come through me, they can come through the team as well. I think that one is is definitely a, a contributor to our, you know, our overall mm. studio vibe and, and people feeling like they... They are more than slamming together a bunch of wireframes for an insurance claim process. Mm. That said, Andy, there is also value and social benefit to be found in very unassuming design practices. Because if you want to make the day better for someone who needs to put in an insurance claim because their house was burned down, and this is really the worst day ever and your insurance claim yeah. process is really frictionless and you made their day. But that, that matters. There's something in that that's super unassuming and super small and will never, ever make it to the front of the Guardian, but it matters. And I, I think there's that detailed practice that, that can be very socially beneficial. Which is the answer to Steve Beatty's question, actually, mm. you know, I think, which is I think that, yes, Design has become more and more about facilitation, particularly on a strategic level. I mean, there's so much in kind of what you just said. Part of it is, I think, yes, designers maybe wear their kind of feelings on their sleeve a little bit more than other people in sort of corporate business environments. I don't think it's true that designers have more feelings than, than anyone else, right? And I think one of the things that has 
we always need to remember is that uh, everyone has feelings, and you know a lot of the a lot of the pressures that often come from you know uh, high up execs and C suite is not coming from a place of heartlessness. It's actually a lot of it's coming from anxiety and fear, mm. right? That drives a lot of the kind of stuff, and as so a hence the need to facilitate that and, and understand what's driving this behaviour that I'm perceiving as negative. And uh, how there's something around the communications of what we're doing that's making this person feel un- uneasy and anxious, mm. and therefore they're starting to sort of grip tighter and and actually kind of make it worse. So there's a there's a kind of bit about that that I think is 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 really crucial. Where is some of the some of the tools that you use and the the lens through which you kind of view people as a designer are very very helpful in that in that leadership role and in kind of talking to stakeholders and the rest of it. And then down the other end. I'm really glad you said that because I think there's a there's a I'm gonna I know we're talking about leadership quite a lot, but it also gets quite fetishized in, <laughs> in the sense that there's sometimes just fixing an everyday annoyance for someone, you know, and it can be quite small. You know, the the corner of the thing that you constantly catch your hip on every time you walk past, that that kind of thing grinds people down and especially you started off talking about your experience with uh, Combank and the kind of employee experience with enterprise software which is you know legendary for being awful oh god the stuff that I saw out in the field yeah right right and so you (laughs) fix some of those things and you really do make you know and you aggregate the kind of effect of that you make people's lives better you make everyone work a bit better and over the kind of thousands of people who work with that stuff you know it actually has a kind of big payoff so, you know, I think that that, to answer this, go back to Steve's question, I think that's the two levels of Zoom that I would talk about mm. kind of because I'm obsessed by levels of Zoom, which is that the details affect the big picture and the big picture affect the details and you need to be able to kind of go between the two. Agreed. You are uh, also a well-known and much fated face in, you know, you've top 100 Australian professionals, 2020 top 10 Australian women entrepreneurs, by My Entrepreneur magazine, one of the 100 Women of Influence, named by Westpac and also the Australian Financial Review. So there's a lot been around you as a leader and a lot around you as an entrepreneur and a, and a woman in leadership. You know, I coach a lot of women in leadership too. I'm interested in what your experience has been. You know, I saw a slight kind of eye roll as I was reading that kind of stuff out from your bio and we talked about it a bit before it's always weird kind of reading your own bio and thinking I'm not that person yeah I do feel like they're talking about someone else <laughs> <laughs> so well let's talk about this imposter syndrome or as it's originally known as an imposter phenomenon actually the original researcher who, who looked into it which I much prefer because it sounds like a thing that comes and goes rather than a, an affliction for life mm. how much have you been cognizant of being a woman in leadership in this role and then how much has that been sort of made evidence to you by maybe some of the clients or stakeholders? Or how much has it been something that you've thought, I, it doesn't really play a role, it's just a kind of happenstance of uh, who I am? It, it, it absolutely plays a role. I mean, when I was listed as one of the 100 women of influence in 2016, my initial reaction was, well, they must not have had enough women apply. Right. I didn't understand how... I was worthy of getting on that list. And if, if you look at some of the women who are also on that list that year, you know, Dr. Karen Phelps, you know, Gina mm-hmm. Reinhardt, I think, was on that list that year. But I felt like an absolute imposter. And literally, I did think they just must not have had enough women like that year. They must have been desperate to include me. <laughs> so that imposter syndrome, it's definitely valid and and it. It has afflicted me to some degree. I think I'm better now. I think I'm, uh, I have a better sense of my worth, a better sense of my value, I guess, and confidence in my ability. I think I, I've gone, uh, you know, as we've talked about, sort of a very meteoric rise into leadership. Mm. It was at sort of, I don't know, a 40-degree angle while I was uh, running SIFT. And uh, mm-hmm. doing my own thing as a sole director for a small company in Australia. And then I joined Design It, which is a global organization. And it has gone to like, I'm, I'm almost at like 85 mm-hmm. degrees of going up in yeah. terms of things that I'm learning, opportunities I'm being given. And I think that that, that that has actually, the last two years, I've learned more about 
what I'm capable of than I think in in the majority of the rest of my career, my previous career. Being a woman in leadership is, I don't know, I was, I was watching Jane Caro last night on Q&A in Australia, which is an Australian current affairs where mm. they have, you know, notables yeah talking about politics and things like that. And Jane Caro is a commentator, yeah. particularly on on women's role in society and, and how, uh, you know, they are either adv- advantaged or not. And her diatribe last night was a literal fury about mm. the situation that many older women in Australia are now finding themselves in terms of being truly poor in their old age due to how they've been affected by COVID, looking down the barrel of homelessness. Um, and yeah. And superannuation inequity, right? Exactly. Superannuation inequity because, you know, you take the departure from work if you choose to have a family or you may take a departure from work and therefore your superannuation is always going to be less than your male counterparts. And you get paid less so you're starting, yeah. You know, all, all of, all of yeah. the things, Andy, all of the things. Yes. And so as a woman in leadership and as a woman just, you know, traversing the world, my belief is the standard that you walk past is the standard you accept which is the chief of army's statement. And, mm. you know, I'll call it out. I'll, I'll call bullshit on uh, sexism. I'll call bullshit on bad behavior. I will, I will do it. But let me tell you, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. And, and yeah. personally, and, you know, women friends that I have, we sort of sit on this throne of rage. We've got a rage filled cushion mm. that we sit on and we kind of tap into it when we need it to really, you know, call it because, it's there's a there's a word for it. It's called feminist fatigue. It's where you've just been feminist all day, every day, and it's mm. really really tiring. And nobody thanks you for it. And generally, what you'll end up with if you really you know make it your job to call things out is being in the situation of uh, you know people like Van Batten or Clementine Ford who are just abused on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, yeah. threatened threatened with you know rape or or uh you know being murdered because they are standing up for women and standing up for women's views. And so like why would you bring that on yourself? <laughs> why? But equally, how could you not? Because you know, I just want to you know just say men behave better. Just behave better. Um, do better. Yeah. Not all men, but that's not the point, you know, definitely no, some no, guys no, no, though. No, 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 definitely. I mean, and, you know, that's the, the work to be done. And, uh, you know, my friends of colour and women of colour, you know. Exactly. Uh, Tanara Schneider, an ex-colleague of mine on the podcast a little while ago, and she said, you know, there are times when obviously she'll, again, it takes the energy to, to fight that fight. And there mm-hmm. are other times when She's just like, don't don't bring me in to be your representative of this or representative of all women or all people of colour. Do your work, do do your homework, you know, and and do it yourself. I do find myself being brought into uh, meetings where the stakeholder is a senior woman. So if it's a yeah. if it's a C level woman, I'll I'll get tapped on the shoulder shoulder by some of my right. sales colleagues and going, hey, can you take this one? <laughs> can you can you come along? It'd be good to good if you could come and do this. And I'm like, what? You want me to do the lady dance in front of the lady? So that's not how it works. Like I have to actually have to have something that that person is going to value for me to have a conversation yeah, with him sure. or her. Yeah. It's irrelevant my gender in what yeah. I bring to that meeting. Although the only thing is, I would say there is, you know, uh, maybe there's a, I will come, but you're going to do the work and I'm going to give you feedback on on what you did. You know, that that (laughs) could be, if you could be bothered to, um, (laughs) yeah, basically. But then, you know, that still places a lot of kind of energy on on you to to do that work and and, um, not have the self-reflection. Yeah, and I think the the one that that really irritates me the most is when you you get told that the way that you are claiming your space or making your point about something that's uh, sexist or, you know, the behaviour that's bad, you get asked or, or told to do it nicer. Otherwise, you know, you won't get anybody to engage with your viewpoint. And yeah. I'm like, why should I have to defend my fundamental human rights nicely? <laughs> why, why is that a thing? Why do I have to diminish myself and my voice in order to make you, not you personally, but you, whoever I'm calling out, feel comfortable mm. and okay with being called out and willing to listen to what I've got to say. Why do I have to make myself small so that you can feel okay with that? 
So the the whole thing of kind of be quiet, don't rock the boat, don't have a voice, or turn you um, know turn your lady. voice down is <laughs> right. So I'm interested in this because because it gets it's an external script. Obviously, it gets socialised to be an internal script for a lot of women in leadership. Men have a kind of different thing, I think, which I think. Uh, Men are driven a lot more by fear and anxiety than any men will give uh, credence to mm. or admit to. Um, but there's a and, and it sort of it, it's actually what causes a lot of that kind of bad behaviour and, and some of the aggressive behaviour too, you know. And in fact, a lot of the reactions to women uh, standing up, it, it's a fear reaction mm. as much as anything else. I'm interested in if there was a sort of moment or an experience you've had or what you draw upon to not take on that internalised script or whether it was there for a while and there was a moment when you thought, no, well, sod this, I'm not going to do this anymore or if it's something that's grown on you or whether it's always been with you. I can I can pinpoint the exact moment. I was living in London. I was working for Sapient at the time. We were working with an English bank on a, a fairly technical, actually, project. So a lot of the people were from, from the tech side of it and yeah. also there were the business stakeholders as well from, from the bank. And I remember being in, the, in a meeting. I was running the whole show, like I was running the project. I was running all of, all of the facets that this meeting was actually called about. And I got into the meeting and everybody came in and sat down and the man from the bank next to me that people had started discussing things and he looked at me and he said, mm. oh, are you going to take some minutes? Uh, and I, <gasps> I, yeah, and I, I was I like, I'm, I'm, I'm not having this. And this is, this is the first time I can really remember calling it out and I just said, why? Because I'm the only woman in the room? And it was really satisfying to just watch him like curl up into like something, a slug that mm. I'd put salt on <laughs> and... I said, I'll take notes for myself, but, you know, I'm, I'm not here for the minute taking. I'm here to facilitate this session. This is my job here. And that's the first time I remember, like, really standing up for myself and going, nah, <laughs> screw this. I'm, I'm not mm. going to be that cast in that role, I guess. Uh, and ever since then, like, I don't, you know, I don't do it all the time perfectly and I, I'm not, you know... I, I didn't fight every battle. I mean, I think in terms of fatigue, you have to choose the hills you're going to die on. Yeah. yeah. You know, which which hills are worth dying on? And that's a, a good yeah. leadership tip is also, you know, choose the hills you're going to die on um, because sometimes sometimes it's not worth it. Sometimes you can't, you can't actually have any impact and then you just might need to just take a rest so you can come back and, and fight for something that you really, really care about. That was, that was the turning point. That was um, yeah. early 2000s, I guess. So I just turned 30. No, I was late 20s. Mm. Right. Um, yeah, so it was fairly, you know, late on to develop that. Well, not, not necessarily. My 16-year-old stepdaughter is already better at it than I was at that age. Well, good, good for her, you know. No, no not particularly because, you know, I know women who are much older, uh, older than you are now and will still have that kind of anxiety, I guess, about speaking up, not because they don't see the outrage of it, but because, you know, you know, there's a CLM, the career-limiting move, you know, of, you know, that that's going to be negatively um, reflect back upon me. And it, and it does, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've been called abrasive by my peers, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and that was recently. Like, and, and, it's, and it's by someone who probably thinks he's a good guy and not sexist in any way, shape or form. But, yeah, I, I was called abrasive and that it really yeah. hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's... Um you know, it's not something we're going to kind of completely unpack. I, I mentioned the, you mentioned mm. age. May I ask how old you are now? I am 46 and a half. I'll be 47 next year. <laughs> I love the way you said that like a kid. <laughs> oh, 46 and a half, 46 and three quarters. I'm pretty excited about getting older. I'm like, I'm, I'm fine with it. I've been talking quite a lot in, in the sort of podcast recently about the the second half of life. And you know, there is a kind of st shift in in those kind of late 30s, late 40s, uh, in that sort of period of time into a different role. And it is common for people to move into a leadership role in that time. So, uh, you know, you were probably one of the, you know, top, there's all these kind of, you know, top 40 under 40 and all the, or top 30 under 30. I'm, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the you know. Top 50 top over 50? <laughs> under, yeah, or something, you know. I feel that kind of youth and entrepreneurship is, is somewhat fetishized. Having been a, uh, you know, top 10 Australian woman entrepreneur, 
what are your feelings about that? Not that you're getting old, but you know. Uh, look, I'm, I'm deeply at peace with my age. I have no, no issues. In fact, I think I just get better. The more that I know, yeah. the more I understand yeah. my power and the better I can be at all the things I turn my hand to. So more, You're comfortable with who you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm, right? I'm good with that. Um, I think mm. we absolutely, we do fetishise youth in entrepreneurship and if you are able to be a successful entrepreneur or uh, you know it's just successful as a young person then it's 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 somehow a, a minor miracle um that's worthy of massive celebration which you know it seems churlish to not want to celebrate people's successes i'd be very keen you know like you are to see some celebration of someone who was over 65 and kind of thought that they were at the end of their career and then had, you know, a spark and an idea and they were able to spin up a successful business. Now, I think that's also a great story yeah. worthy of celebrating. I don't think we should, yeah. I, we shouldn't, you know, not celebrate one at the expense of the other. I think there's, no, 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 there's no, plenty so. of room to, to celebrate all, but I think one definitely does get a lot more attention because, you know, as a society, I mean, if we can get really you know, psychological, we fetishise mm. youth in general. Yeah, we do. Uh, youth and beauty and and all of that is is absolutely, you know, aspirational and, and what we all want to be. You know, people, uh, you know, not you and me because we don't care. Uh, we're happy to get old. But, you know. What are you saying? I'm not youthful and beautiful anymore. You are youthful and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have a, a fine face of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Grey hair. Um, no, it's all right. I, I am in the same boat. It's just that I'm not willing to give it up yet and will continue to. I tell you, I'm not, I'm not going to dye my beard, that's for sure. Oh, that's, oh, that's like hair next level weird. About it, skin colour. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. We, do, we fetishise youth yeah. or in general yeah. and also absolutely in business and entrepreneurship. Yeah. I think there's only certain places where grey hair is appreciated and it's usually only of a male grey hair. Uh, mm. Women, you know, female grey hair is, is not appreciated anywhere and I, you know, I don't fight that fight at all. I can't be bothered. It's, it's not, yeah. not important. But I would like to see the story of the, the person who thought that they were at the end of their career and they spun up a business. And let's celebrate a list of top 10 of those. Yeah. I mean, in many respects, it's a lot harder to do when you're in your 50s because you've got all the established responsibilities of kind of, you know, family and mortgage and, and all the rest of it. In a way, it's a, you don't have much to lose it's, in your 20s. Yeah, it's harder you know, you, to take the risk. You eat a lot of pot noodles, but, yeah. but otherwise you kind of, <laughs> you know, and live in a kind of cheaper rented a, a shared apartment. I mean, risk is definitely a kind of an adventure often for the youth, but I think it's a thing that... As you get older, you get a little bit more scared of, to a detriment, actually. I think it's one of the kind of things that people get, gets people stuck in that second half of life is th mm. you know, they don't feel like they want to take the risk anymore. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. But also, I don't, I'm, I'm not that person either. I will, I will try anything and see what works. I'll interview you in 20 years' time and we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> So listen, we're coming up for time. First of all, as you know, the podcast is named after this Ray and Charles Eames film, Powers of Ten, about the relative science of things in the universe. So the final question is, what small thing, either something that's overlooked or something that could do with being redesigned, would make an outsized effect on the world? How far back in history can I go? Well, it should be something that is kind of could be redesigned or is, current, is still relevant now, put it that way. I think the fundamental premise of social media is something that should have been redesigned mm. <laughs> or at least yeah. in its in its outset anybody somebody anybody thinking about the unintended consequences of the yeah. change let's 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 go for a neutral word the change that it has brought about to our society our social interactions our understanding of truth our our democracies and I really feel like there was a moment in time in, in the generation of, of social media and, and particularly in, in the monetization of the data that is collected in social media where there could have been a better conversation about unintended consequences and different design directions taken. That would be my thing that we could have done better and um, would have had a, a remarkable effect. Yeah. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. We haven't even talked about design and AI and all those <laughs> things, but um, <laughs> the, you know, not enough red teaming of of ideas and concepts of you know how could this be abused and how could this how could we hack this how could how yeah. how might people how might this get out of control? I feel like the next one's coming, and and this there's this moment mm. in time, which is Elon Musk and his Neuralink project that he's working on yeah. where, you know, he's talking about downloading memories into like a robotic self and, you know, being yeah. able to write to the brain and, and this whole brain interface. And and I feel like there's, well, I know for a fact because I watched the press release from end to end, mm -hmm. there was nobody there talking about ethics. And just because we can, does it mean we should? There yeah. was nobody there when they asked the question about what's the the most important problem that Neuralink has to solve to realise its true potential, the answer to that was we need to find the right thin wires to stick into the brain. Nothing about ethics or the ethical minefield that's laying around that project. And I, I really am deeply concerned that we're at, a, at an inflection point similar to where we were when Mark Zuckerberg decided, you know, he wanted to create something so he could figure out who at his university was, you know, single or not. We're at an inflection point where somebody's got to be asking those questions. Otherwise, I, yeah. I feel like we're going to have another, in 10 years' time, another set of unintended consequences and end up with biological inequalities and you know all sorts of things. Yeah. Desirable, viable and feasible needs and ethical on there as well. Although I would argue that it's um, that should be under the desirable thing, really. Well, we could have another whole podcast about that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just don't have time. <laughs> we'll save it for another time talking of social media so where can people find you online uh, I am findable obviously on LinkedIn and that is an easy way to get a hold of me I'm also findable on Twitter as Lucky Cat L-U-C-K-Y-K-A-T and I'm mm -hmm. also on Instagram first name last name easy to find <laughs> I'll put some links to it in the show notes oh cool Katya thank you so much for being my guest on Power of 10 you're so very welcome thank you for having me as I'm sure you're aware, you've been listening to Power of Ten. My name is Andy Pullane. You can find me at apullane on Twitter or pullane.com, where you can find more episodes and sign up for my newsletter, Doctor's Note. If you like the show, please take a moment to give it a rating on iTunes. It really helps others find us. And as always, get in touch if you have any comments, feedback or suggestions for guests. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next time.